Hey there, I hope you're doing well. I'm Andrew, and I watch an uncomfortable amount of ASMR videos. Today we're going to be talking a little bit more about programming in XR Toolkit. If you're here from my last video, welcome back. If this is your first time watching one of these videos, in this series we're kind of exploring how to program in XR Toolkit using C Sharp. So if you have any C Sharp knowledge and you're trying to figure out how exactly you can use that with XR Toolkit a bit better, you're in the right place. In the last video, we wrote some really basic functionality and hooked it up to some of the events that we can get from interactables. Specifically, we wrote some functionality to spin the bit of a drill when we pull the trigger, or once we've triggered the activate event. In this video, based on some of the feedback that I got in the last video, we are going to factor in the actual trigger value this time around. It's going to actually be a pretty different approach, so this is going to be a pretty uh, interesting process for us to go through, because as simple as it may sound, there was quite a journey for me just to set it up in my own like basic sense for this video. So I guess that's enough of the intro. Let's see what I have going on on the screen over here. And as you can see here, we have a pretty similar scene as we did before. The only difference that I've really made is I've made the, uh, the drill green from the red that I had previously, just to kind of show that, uh, it's a easy, that this is going to be a different interactable than it was previously. Before, you may have noticed that we had a XR grab interactable component here that I've taken off because we're going to be writing our own component for this. But much like before, if we expand the dropdown here, we still have a bit, we have a handle for our uh, little collision boxes here, and we have an attach point. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually create a new script so we can in inherit from the XR grab interactable. And once we kind of get that open, I'll start to explain why we're kind of doing what we're doing here. So I'm going to go to my scripts folder here and right click and create, and we're going to just call this drill interactable. The name isn't particularly important. You can name it whatever you want. And let's open that up in visual studio. All right. And this time around, let's make sure we're zoomed in far enough. So it's <laughs> easy to read the code. Also, what you're going to need for this video is a nice beverage, even though I'm in my early thirties and it's in the mid afternoon. Yeah, I'm drinking caffeine. I like to live dangerously. All right. So the first thing that we're going to be doing in this script is changing where we're actually inheriting from. Instead of the mono behavior, we want to inherit from the XR grab interactable. But before we do that, we actually need to, need to add the XR toolkit namespace. So let's do that. Cool. And in this case, in the last video, I showed you the simple interactable and I showed you the grab interactable and we can inherit from e either of those depending upon what kind of functionality we want. But since we need to be able to grab this, we're going to inherit from the XR grab interactable. And much like before, we're going to need a couple of variables. So let's get rid of these two functions and let's make some serialized fields here. Same before we're going to have a bit transform as well as a speed variable. So we'll have a private transform that we'll just call bit transform. I should have just had these <laughs> copied over, but it's not a big deal. So if this is your first video watching that works out for you. And we'll make a speed as well. And we'll initialize this to 100. And let's also just write out the functions that we're going to need for this. The big thing that we're going to be using is the process interactable, which is more or less the update of an interactable that's invoked by the interaction manager. You may be wondering why we don't use update, but it's a bit more performant to have one system with one update that is responsible for updating a ton of objects rather than having an update in all of your mono behaviors. So this is why we're just going to be using the process interactable. So we'll be using the override keyword. We'll write void and then process interactable. So anytime that this gets updated by the interaction manager, we're going to run some functionality if it's valid. And much like before, that functionality is going to be the rotate bit. And at this point, what's kind of interesting about this is I was thinking that Oh, all I would need to do is check to see if the interactable is activated and then run the functionality and get some value from the controller. That's pretty straightforward, but there isn't a lot of scaffolding for measuring when an object is activated. Let me show you. So when I first started doing this, I thought to myself what I could easily do because there isn't an easy variable to check to see if this is selected or it's like similar to is selected or is hovered. As we're in this interactable, we can easily check if it's selected by using this uh, is selected variable, or we can even say is hovered. But the unfortunate thing is there is no is activated. So I thought to myself, well, if that's the case, 
I can write some functions here. I believe it's public override or it's protected override. I always forget. Be protected override void on activate on so we can have on activate and then we can have oh this is the wrong one <laughs> let's make sure that we're going to use the one with the right arguments for the example that i could easily have on activated and then i could have this boolean value here i would just say private bool is activated initialize that to false and then once it becomes activated i could just say oh it's is activated equals true and then when it's deactivated we can equal false but the sort of issue with this is that it's only activated once you pull the trigger all the way down and so we're actually not going to be able to rotate the drill accurately if we can only trigger that event once the trigger has already been pulled down not when it's just pulled down a little bit you would think we'll just change the pull threshold for the event or for the input but that's also going to fundamentally change a lot of other things in our project potentially. So that wasn't an option that I wanted to do. So my logic was going to be once it's activated or if is activated, we would just call this function rotate bit. And that was, that was like my initial stab at this project before I realized this roadblock. And this is where the actual benefits of inheriting from the grab interactable sort of actually kind of came into play here. The initial example was going to be, oh, look, you can easily override this and add these extra values. But then I realized, well, these aren't useful to me. So what we're actually going to do is this, which I'll show you right now. So let's remove this because this isn't going to be useful to us. And we can actually change this is activated to is selected. And what we also want to do is that in this process interactable, you'll see that we get this argument of a type of update phase. And this is going to map really similarly to the normal update or the fixed update that's built into the mono behavior. If we go to its definition, we'll see that we have the fixed, like a fixed update, dynamic, which is just our normal update, and even our late and on before render, which are a little bit more on the, uh, we don't use those as much, but uh, they're good to have. So we can exit out of that. But what we want to do is that we only want to update in a particular phase. If I just left this here, it would update in every single phase, which it'll still work fine, but I like to be a little bit more specific in when things get updated. So we'll have an additional if statement here that says update phase if it's equal to that dynamic phase. So this is just gonna be the equivalent of our normal update. And so then we'll just copy this code and we'll put it in here. So all this is really doing for us at this point is when the interaction manager processes this interactable, if it's in the dynamic phase and if this object is selected, it's gonna rotate the bit. And you're probably already thinking, well, Andrew, I thought we were supposed to rotate it when it when it's activated. Don't worry, we're going to kind of approach that now. So within rotate bit, before we write our actual code, we need to find out something very specific for this to work. With interactors within XR Toolkit, not everything has the same type of information. And we kind of covered that in the last video with some of the different interfaces. Not every single interactor is going to implement the same interfaces. And the thing about interactors is that they all do inherit from the XR base interactor, but for our direct and our ray interactor, they also both inherit from the XR base controller interactor, which that associates it with the controller so we can get things like input and the tracking of the position and the rotation. This is a pretty stark contrast to the uh, socket interactor, which doesn't have a controller associated with it. It is an interactor because it inherits from the XR base interactor, but it doesn't have the same information as the direct and the ray interactor. So for us to be able to ask a interactor or a controller, hey, what is the trigger value? We need to make sure that we can actually get a controller from that interactor. Hopefully that makes sense. We'll look at the code and hopefully that'll alleviate a few things. So at this point, we just wanna make sure the interactor that has selected this drill interactable has the information that we want. And we can do that by writing if first interactor selecting if it is a XR base controller interactor. And we're just gonna call this interactor for the time being. And what we can do now is we can go look at the definition so we can see a little bit more of what I'm talking about. So if we right click, we'll go to the definition. You'll see that we have all of this stuff, but we're specifically, I don't wanna have to search for it. I think it's just going to be the controller, I believe that you'll see that it has a reference to the controller that is associated with it. Because if you remember on the XR rig, the game object 
that a direct or a ray interactor is on, has also has an XR controller on it. So this is sort of where you can start to see the connection of where we're going to be able to get some of this information. What you may see some people do is that they either decorate the left or the right hand controller with additional script telling if it telling it if it's the left or the right controller and then trying to reference the input individually. So you may see something like if left, you know, do something specific here. It would be like get left hand value else get right hand value. So this is what you'll see a lot of the times when people write things like this. And this is not the approach that we're going to take. Since we already know what interactor is going to be selecting the drill, we can cast it to be like, oh, hey, do you have any type of controller information? And we can get the information that way. The ultimate goal of writing it like this is to alleviate this necessary thing to have multiple references and needing to figure it out. A lot of the information is already baked into XR Toolkit. We just need to find it. So let me show you what I mean by that. So if we get rid of that, our controller has a number of has a number of what we call interaction states. And each of those interaction states have inf has information that's copied from the input system, so then XR Toolkit can sort of work with the information a little bit easier. So if we have an interaction state here, I'm just going to call this an activate state. And we have the interactor that we've casted. We have a reference to an XR controller, and then we have interaction states that I believe for select, activate, all that good stuff. So we specifically want the activate interaction state. And let's take a closer look with what kind of information this has. And you'll notice that this already looks pretty similar to the type of information that we can get from the input system, except it's just been copied over into this separate struct. So, so like I said, XR Toolkit can use it a bit easier. And we have a value, we can check if it's active, if it was pressed this frame, if it was released this frame, and some other information that's called manually by uh, XR Toolkit. But you can already see where I'm going with this. We can use this value from this interaction state and factor it into the rotation of the drill bit. So we don't necessarily need to know and we don't care if this is the left or the right hand and then needing to go and find a value elsewhere, we can just use what's already built into it. So all we need to do now is call our bit transform code. So, or our rotation. So we'll get our bit transform. We'll call rotate, and like before, we'll have vector three dot forward, and we'll multiply it by the activate state and the value that we're getting from it. And this is going to be our trigger value, and we'll multiply it by our speed as well. And then we want to multiply that we're getting from our vector three dot forward, the value of the trigger and the speed that we want it to move at by time dot delta time. And believe it or not, that's actually it also get rid of our namespaces here because I'm a weirdo. And, and believe it or not, that's it. To sort of recap what we're doing, we have this update that is occurring from our interaction manager within the sort of update phase. If this item is selected, let's, let's attempt to rotate the bit. When we call that function, we'll say, hey, is this interactor one that has information that we can use to actually potentially rotate the bit so it's not a socket or maybe even a poke interactor? We want to get the activation state from the controller that's associated with that interactor. And then we want to factor the value from that interaction state within our rotation of the transform. So I think this is pretty straightforward rather than needing to mess with uh, input more directly. But now that that's all said and done, let's set this back up and the scene. So let's select our drill prefab here, drag our drill interactor bowl there. We'll put our attached transform as well. And then you'll notice that we have all of these fields that we recognize from previously or our other interactables, but we also have the two additional fields that we just wrote. So we have our bit transform and our speed. So we'll set our bit transform as well, and we will apply our changes. So now let's test this to make sure it works. So I'm going to plug my headset in. All right, so let's hit play. And now that I've grabbed the drill, if I slowly pull the trigger here, you'll see that it has a variable speed based on how much I've pulled the trigger. And to make that a little bit more noticeable, let's actually update the speed to something like 500 or something. There we go. And there we go. It's actually working as expected. And on the first time too.
All right, I think that about is it for this second video on XR Toolkit programming. If you found this video helpful, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any feedback on the next video, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll see what I can do. Um, I think that's about it. Well, actually, before I forget, I wanted to thank all of my lovely patrons. I don't know which side of the screen I'm going to put it on, but I'm going to put their names here. I just wanted to thank all of these wonderful people for sticking with me through the uh, number of years that I've been doing this. Um, now, I think that's it for me. I'll see you all around.